Hello, I'm Alan Stoga, Chairman of the Telberg Foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to today's virtual celebration of global leadership and emerging global leaders. As much as I'd rather be doing this in person, today's audience, which is the upside of virtual, today's audience is will represent people from 80 different countries. We are a virtual Noah's Ark today. This is the last stop of a journey that started in March when we launched the nomination process uh, for 2022. That process produced 2,400 nominations from 132 countries. On Tuesday of this week, we honored the three established leaders that the jury chose. Today, we honor three emerging leaders, people whom the jury believe have enormous potential for exponential growth on an already solid foundation of leadership and of accomplishment. Today's event and these winners represent a new direction for us. Before 2021, we did not distinguish between established and emerging leaders, arguing simply that a leader is a leader is a leader. Gradually though, we came to realize that established leaders can be assessed largely through their accomplishments, through their track records, while emerging leaders are more about potential than track records. All great ones, the kind we're looking for, have some of both. Importantly, this is not about age. It's about emerging leadership. That's what we're looking for. So we have begun to separate the two, adjusting processes, protocols, criteria. The three people whom you will meet in a few minutes are already demonstrating leadership that is innovative, courageous, rooted in universal values, and global in perspective. The jury believes not only that they have done some amazing things already, but most of what they will do is in the future. So what we'd like to do today is to give you an opportunity to meet the three winners. They will be, as you know from the, the schedule, from the agenda that is in the chat, um, you have an opportunity to meet them virtually um, and to ask them questions. So as you, as you listen, as you think about what you hear, please send questions through the Q&A uh, function on, on your Zoom dashboard. Now I am proud to introduce the winners of the 2022 Telberg SNF Eliason Global Leadership Prize who are emerging. My interest in mushroom started back in my village in Marange. I became an orphan when I was seven. And at that age, I had to be responsible for putting food on the table. And I lived with my grandmother with whom I had my very first experiences of foraging for wild mushrooms. I realized the potential of cultivating mushrooms and providing hope and food for other people by this first encounter in my village. After my training, I came back to my village. I was able to grow mushrooms, to sell them, earn some money, able to buy food for myself, but also paying school fees for other orphans in my community. I started in the School for the Blind Thessaloniki as a chess trainer back in 1993. Two years after, blind football became a movement globally in order to start the official sport. And after the chess trainings, I went down with my chess players to practice this sport, me as a sighted goalkeeper and them as totally blind footballers. It took me 20 years to realize the need to create a unique mini blind football. A blind football for adults exists in the Paralympic calendar. But when I met Leandros, changed my life. I gave him the adults ball that already existed, and it was impossible for him to play with his little sisters. Comparte por una vida Colombia was founded in 2018 in Colombia, and we felt the urge to start working with the host communities in order to tell them who were these people who was migrating from Venezuela to Colombia. Right now, we have almost 3 million Venezuelans living in Colombia. So we started thinking how we can start closing those gaps between those communities, host communities and the migrants' communities. And we do this through our model Stay in School, which has three components. So we started working through recovering of malnourishment, the second component, which is very important, is all the public health. So we promote and we prevent some practices like a wash and access to water and the warming, mental health. 
And also we have a wonderful component with it, which is governance and um, with right and duties. So we started working with these communities to understand their rights and duties. I maintain energy and focus for my work by the positive and tangible results that I see in real people's lives, the ones that I work with every day, the stories of how a mother says, I've been able to give my children a meal every day, that they are able to say, my average income per month is not anymore 74 US dollars, um, but it has grown three or five times more. I've been able to pay school fees for my child. We have not gone to bed without food. Domestic violence has reduced in my household because I'm able to bring something to the table as well. These kind of stories really are what maintains my energy uh, and focus for the work. This ball means a lot for these children because the right to play becomes a reality. Most of the children with visual impairment, they attend general schools and it was impossible to play all together. Now it is possible to play with sighted pupils. So there was a global need to distribute for free and donate these mini blind footballs, not only in my country, but globally. In the last four years, this ball jingles in every country and every territory around the world. The Ball for All is a great need. And uh, there are also many other visionaries around the world that sharing the same values with the Ball for All, to implement it, to deliver it for everybody. And you know, this ball has a heart inside and we follow our hearts. We have challenges every day, of course, and, and I am really grateful for them because those are, are the ones that make us move. This is, this is a way of life. So I, I, I keep the energy understanding that um, serving is first. Serving is my passion. This is a way of life. This is not only a work. This is, this is the way I decided to live my life. And um, it's a commitment I have with myself. In a few minutes, Cheeto, Elias, and Lala will be on screen in conversation with other leaders from the Telberg Network. Now it is my privilege, there he is, to welcome Jan Eliasson. Uh, Jan has been a friend, I think, forever. Um, perhaps equally importantly, he was Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Swedish diplomat par excellence, longtime supporter of the Telberg Foundation. Jan's name is on this prize for a very simple reason. He epitomizes in both my judgment and the judgment of the board of the Telberg Foundation, leadership that is global and leadership that is based on universal values, the kinds of leadership we desperately need in the world today. Welcome, Jan. Thank you very much. <laughs> I wanna spend the next few minutes talking with you about leadership, even though I truly believe leadership is something that is better observed than discussed. But nonetheless, you've worked with leaders from all over the world, not just in politics and diplomacy, but in other walks of life. Some were successful, some failed, most I suspect were mediocre. Uh, but in your experience, what makes great leadership great? Well, first of all, Alan, let me tell you how inspired and impressed I was by the choice of uh, laureates this year. Uh, they point, in fact, to the, in the directions that you imply with your question. Uh, the uh, locally engaged uh, aspect that you see in Cheeto's case, the uh, enormous challenge of migration and refugees in today's world and linking uh, the conditions they leave to the conditions they will have in the, their new countries is absolutely crucial for world developments. But it's also very local in the end. And uh, of course, the ball for all is a moving and touching uh, a way of saying that we have to put the human being in the center. And uh, I think this is what we need in a world where we have so many uncertainties as we have today. So I think the qualities um, 
that I thought of in the past as being self-evident uh, need to be not revised, but at least renewed in the spirit of, uh, uh, for instance, these prizes that have been given to these wonderful uh, persons or personalities. Uh, the innovative aspects are obvious, of course, and uh, the uh, courageous aspect also, if, particularly in the uh, rather heated debate on migration and refugees, you see that clearly, but also this hands-on concrete approach. People are tired of the generalities and uh, leadership today is to be clear. Clarity is to me a key word, but also something which also reflects the complex world in which we live, namely that we have to work together. Uh, these people that we have seen today uh, represent a certain sector, work in their own sector, but they all depend on others. And I think uh, that the most important word in today's world is the word together. That is for them now to take up the baton and go forward, uh, pursuing their individual paths, of course, but at the same time, finding partners and working together with others is going to be the key to great success. And that means a little bit of uh, element of modesty into both thinking of yourself for your own activities and pursue your own mission. But on the other hand, that in the end, the strength of the action and the result will be depending on the number of contacts, the number of, develop of partners yet that you have. And that means that, means that we open up to an open uh, exchange in today's world, which is so sorely needed. I want to ask you about optimism, and maybe a better word, hope. Um, I've been described occasionally as a concerned pessimist. Um, <laughs> and those are in my good days. <laughs> One of the things you and I both have talked about in the past is that the younger leaders we know tend to look at the world in a more hopeful and more optimistic way. Um, and maybe that's because they haven't seen some of the bad movies that you've had to see <laughs> in your career. But how do you how do we leverage, how do we encourage them both to hold on to that optimism, that, that, but also to turn it into positive action? Absent hope, uh, there is no hope. So th this is one of the reasons why I think, I know that we, Telberg, are trying to do this, but, but how in, in your work in some places that have been pretty dark, how, how do you hold on to optimism? Well, on the scale of between uh hope and pessimism, uh, I landed in the category of being a worried optimist. But uh, I tend in today's world sometimes to sink into a, another category, namely the, the, uh, the pessimist who has not given up. And I think what I love about youth and uh, emerging leaders, I would rather say, since you make the point rightly about the youth aspect not being that relevant for leadership uh, is that they they uh, they seem to have a uh, an un, unending unbent uh, energy uh, which I, I think we they, we must build upon. Uh, I am rather Alan worried about the people giving up and uh, giving into hopelessness that the problems are too big, the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis. Uh, therefore, we have to sort of also bring in the element that nobody can do everything, but everybody can uh, do something. Uh, and then we should take advantage of the enormous energy and passion existing with uh, the uh, many of the young and the emerging leaders uh, and bring that into a uh, situation where they not only take advantage of their own passion, but also where they as I said earlier, put the human being in the center and bring in the element of compassion. So without passion, nothing happens in life, but without compassion, certainly the bad things happen. And then there's the little problem of trust. Yeah. Uh, you and I have talked about this many times over the years, every measure of trust in almost every, at least Western society um, has been headed down for years now. Uh, we don't trust, our politicians, we don't trust our, our religious leaders, we don't trust, we don't trust, we don't trust. Um, how do you solve that? How do you reestablish trust? I, I saw an absolutely, I saw an absolutely amazing presentation the other day on Nelson Mandela. And apparently 
uh, tapes that he made in the course of writing his autobiography have now been discovered and, and are available online. So you can listen to Nelson Mandela talk about his yeah. experiences. Uh, and they asked the, the person who was interviewing him asked him about trust. And he said, which, which was an issue in South Africa at the time. And he said, look, a leader, the only way a leader can earn trust is if he trusts people. Um, that that it's it's a, an equation that has to run in both directions or it doesn't work. How do you think about trust and how can leaders gain, maybe regain trust? Well, your, your question is extremely important. Uh, it is a question which can be seen in the geopolitical perspective. Just look at the re relations between United States and Russia and, and US and China and so forth on that level, but also what I find disturbing is that it spreads like a poison, uh, this mistrust also inside nations. We have seen certainly a sharper division among people in, in the countries, and there is a mistrust of uh, those who govern in particular, which is of course in the democracies is a threat to uh, our traditional way of life and our tr democratic uh, uh, traditions. This goes on right now. And uh, what can be done is, of course, to show that we deliver. The, uh, the, the leaders have to deliver results. That's why I stressed the word concrete earlier. It's important that we show that the elected officials and the elected leaders can deliver and show that they deliver. If not, we will be in trouble. But then I basically believe as a diplomat, as you know, that we need to have dialogue. And in my view, there is a diplomacy deficit in the world. We have landed in too many conflicts directly without doing much to prevent them. And uh, we have not used the word as our most important tool, the uh, conversation, the, the exchanges and everything that is of a, a preventive nature. So it's a long work that can be done, but I think these uh, the prizes and the type of dialogues that uh, you, Alan, have uh, created around these laureates is a very dynamic aspect of increasing that dialogue that is necessary, which basically uh, has to do with diplomacy as being the best means to prevent the horrors that we see today. You talk about the gap between promise and delivery in terms of too many governments in too many places. What I found amazing, not just this year with both this set of leaders as well as the established leaders we honored two days ago, none of them are in, are in politics. Uh, none of them are in government, but they're all doing, as you already said, very concrete things. And, and indeed, in the jury conversations this year and in last year as well, as we just talked about the nominations in front of us, one of the things that several of the jurors insisted on was that they wanted people, they wanted to honor leadership that wasn't just in the sort of blah, blah, blah category, but leadership that was both well-informed, intelligent, et cetera, but was actually doing things. And, and the biggest, not fights, but discussions we had were, was trying to understand, okay, that, that person talks a great game, but what is, she, what is she actually doing? And one of the things that I think we can all be proud of at Telberg is that with this cohort of particularly the emerging leaders, and you saw it in the little video, um, all of them are operating on policy issues that in some ways ought to be handled by governments, but aren't, um, but are delivering very concrete results for human beings. Mm. People are better off as a result of their efforts. Uh, and I guess that's the good news. The bad yeah. news is government's failed. The good news is that people are stepping in to not replace government, uh, but indeed to, to, to make sure that those, those, that people get what they deserve and need, even if they have to step in and do it by themselves. Well, you're right. When, when I saw the uh, video from the three uh, laureates, I immediately made uh, contacts and links, so built up links to my own work in diplomacy and world politics. When I saw Chido there, I felt, first of all, the relationship to nature with the mushrooms. Uh, and secondly, the relationship to, to poverty. 
and how to raise uh, the level the standard of living for people out there in the villages all over the world right now. There's a tremendous suffering. When I saw Lala, I was thinking of the debate in Europe on refugees and migrants, where we don't do enough on the integration of our uh, migrants or refugees. And this, in fact, leads to other problems in society which are uh, utilized by the, an opposition that wants to see the outside world as a problem. They see the outside world as merchandise coming from abroad, as ideas coming from abroad, and people from abroad, which in the end all constitute problems. So that, Lala really gave me that reaction of the importance of integration and receiving people in this dignified, respectful way that she showed. And of course, the, the football, I'm a football player myself, or used to be rather, and I said to myself, what a wonderful thing. I almost had tears in my eyes when I saw the, the kids play there, there. And I said to myself that that can also probably translate it to other uh, situations of minorities, people in prison or young people who are in danger to, to cause that, uh, to bring in a, a ball as a, as a catalyst for work and play and uh, joy of life, which is necessary to have the energy uh, on all sides. And, and remember, remembering always this very simple thing that uh, everybody, the, 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 every life is, is, is sacred and that we are all equal. So um, the connection between the laureates and the agenda that we all should accept is obvious to me. Let's leave it there. Again, thank you, Jan, for your long time and continuing support for Telberg uh, and for this leadership initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will follow the program of great interest. Thanks. Now I have the opportunity to introduce to you our three winners who, as I said earlier, will be interviewed by key members of the Telberg Network. As I've already mentioned, please send us questions through the Q&A function that you would like to put to them. And, and, and we'll try to get to them later in the program. In, in random order, Chito Govera will be interviewed by Sitala Namwali, a Kenyan poet and performer. Lala Lavera will be interviewed by Eduardo Amadeo, Argentinian politician and economist, and a close personal friend. And Elias Mastoras will be interviewed by Nithya Ramanathan, an American technologist who won the Telberg Leadership Prize in 2020. Satawa, um, turn your camera on. Please join us. There we go. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, Chido, are you there? Hello, so Satawa, I'm yes, I'm here. Hey, Chido, so good to see you. Uh, this is Chido Govera. And um, one of the most uh, uh, interesting people that I am fortunate enough to have encountered. Uh, you've seen a little bit of what she is. So she's uh, Zimbabwean. So coming, we come from the same continent. Um, a social entrepreneur, a farmer, a campaigner, an educator, a founder of Future of Hope Foundation, an expert in edible and medicinal mushrooms, um, which you something that you're taking across the world, and I know that right now you are in Cuba. Yes. Yes. yes Great. I am. <laughs> Excellent. So um, I have some questions for you. A few questions. We've we've got about twelve minutes. Um, so one of the first questions I wanted to ask you is: You started your journey of leadership. You know, this I, I wanted to hear about your leadership journey, but you started when you were 11 years old, um, when you were basically being rescued, inverted commas, by relatives, you, yourself and your brother and your and your grandmother, and they they offered yeah. you a man, of the, a much older man, to marry, and said, you know, now at least you you'll have food, etc. And many of us. I think all of us have been 11 years old and you said no. Um, and I'm so fascinated by how, what kind of vision you had at 11 years old, that despite the very difficult conditions that you, you found yourself, you, you were able to say no. 
you were not a victim. <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. And tell us also about the philosophy that, that has then governed you in your life. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sitawa. And uh, first of all, many thanks to the Talbig Foundation for this honor. Uh, and especially because, like you say, my work really starts as a young girl who had nothing really to inspire them to want something more in life. I was unfortunate to lose my mother when I was uh, seven years old to, due to HIV and AIDS. And uh, I found myself immediately having to start taking responsibility of my nuclear family, which consisted of my little brother and my grandmother, who was over a uh, hundred years old. And um, for me, what was important was the situation that I found myself in was not going to define who I was. And, mm -hmm. and I wanted very much go to school, I wanted very much to make something of myself, but I was uh, faced with a situation that first of all, uh, made me stop going to school uh, when I was nine. When I was 10, I was indeed offered to marry, but what made me refuse that offer was because I, I felt myself that I wanted to get out of where I was. I didn't mm -hmm. want to chart my life forward based on this story. It was uncomfortable. I had experienced a lot of things that when I was eight years old, I told myself when I get out of this situation, I want to start doing work that help other young girls like myself to mm -hmm. make sure that they never have to find themselves where I am. And uh, thanks to the support of the ecosystem around me. It was a group of uh, women in my community from a church that worked to identify young orphans in the community, people with disabilities and uh, elderly people, and try mm -hmm. to channel opportunities towards them. And I think that really marked the philosophy for me where I think you can say this is actually rooted in the African philosophy of Ubuntu. Right. Right. I learned very early on that I am because we are. And mm -hmm. not just because we are as humans, but because I had this ecosystem of people from church who are thinking, what can we do for those who can't help themselves? Right. And the fact that I was helped through that that the network of around me managed to help me to get out of this, mm -hmm. it strengthened my conviction in saying, I want to dedicate my life to helping those people who cannot do it on their own, to create opportunities for them so that they can start rewriting their stories, redefining uh, 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 their, their lives. So I know that um, you have spread your wings out into the world. Uh, taking this this message and and taking uh, supporting uh, not just people within your community and your country, but various countries uh, in Africa, Asia, and I also read that you uh, have uh, uh, activities uh, in Germany and the U.S. And I'd like to know yeah. what is what is it what is it that that drives you what is it that has made you um, uh, go out there, and also how. What is the difference? Because usually we're not we're not used to seeing um, Africans going and doing development work essentially in, <laughs> in Germany and, and uh, the US. Um, and re I'm really proud of you. So let tell us a little bit, bit about that. So I'm tempted to share a quote from my life partner who says mm -hmm. the global only exists from the generosity of the local. And uh, right. this and the African philosophy of Ubuntu, we, we have a lot that we can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it is be because of that, to share what you have and to learn from the others what they are able to offer is how I end up uh, going into the world like this. Um, when I learned to farm mushrooms, I was 11 years old and I was connected to a network of people who were doing the same work in the world. And that actually started my journey of traveling around the world, teaching people. But what's more important is that I also was very clear, I wanted to simplify mushroom farming and take it to places 
where mm -hmm. at the time people thought you cannot farm mushrooms in a village. I think in the short video that introduces me, you see the yeah. village where I grew up. Uh, yeah. Mushroom farming is a science and it's confined to you know sterile environment, people who have access to laboratories. And I was a girl from a village who saw the potential of taking using mushrooms to convert agrobiomass, which is waste. Uh, to say it simply, and that was the only resource which was abundant in my community. And so I saw an opportunity and I thought, I want to try and do something to make sure that this opportunity can benefit people like me, not just in Zimbabwe, but everywhere in the world where there is a need. And that's how I end up uh, um, uh, traveling around. You find, if you look at the different pictures of the places where we work in Zimbabwe, you find mm -hmm. a traditional hut, which is made out of mud with sticks and thatched with grass, is actually the best mushroom house. Right, right. But when you're introduced to it, uh, uh, I learned about it, it's complicated. Not everyone takes the knowledge that is already available in our world to simplify it so it can right. reach everybody, so that everyone who interacts with it, regardless of who they are, they see that they have a role to play. Right, fantastic. Um, now you have been awarded, you are an emerging leader. Um, and I would like to know, uh, what is it that this award is going to give, give you? What is it? What is your life going to look like, for example, in 10 years, in terms of your leadership? <laughs> Uh, your role as a leader, you know, what 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 are you going to do with this? I think uh, what I will do with this is to continue the journey of inspiring others. I really, uh, um, for me, this 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 shows that a girl from a village can do it. A girl <laughs> effort on on a local level can mm -hmm. actually have a global uh, uh, um, impact. And, and by doing this, you really help me to show the people, the communities that I interact with, to say mm -hmm. you're not limited by the circumstances where you find yourself in. And also mm -hmm. to inspire other people uh, in, in, in the world to say you can help others to unlock their potential. And mm -hmm. this kind of encouragement is very, very much appreciated. We, we want to be able to share more about the work that we are doing so that more people see it and more people can support it. But also mm -hmm. other young girls, young women and young boys in the communities where they really need this the most can see it and have something that they say, this is where I want to get to, to kind of motivate mm -hmm. others to say, you can change it from where you are to a stage different and everything you do matters. And I think okay. this is very important. <laughs> Brilliant. So we've come to the end and there's one thing that I'd like you to just quickly address and that is the term appetite. You mentioned it as your philosophy, the one that keep, that stops, started you and made you say no in the village and to, and, yes. and, and to say yes in the world. So tell us a little bit about that. To, I mean, <laughs> I set out to change my relationship with hunger. <laughs> okay. To embrace this appetite, wanting something more than what I have now. And my mm -hmm. appetite is to explore my full potential as a human being, as a young woman, um, not bounded by my past. And my appetite is to ensure also that other young people, other women like myself can explore also their appetite. They just don't give, they just don't receive what they are dealt, but they get also what they crave. Thank you very much, Chido Govera. Thank you very much for that. Um, everybody can see this is a person who refuses to be a victim, even though the circumstances are screaming victimhood. So I'm yeah. really excited about what, what you are and the possibility you, you offer all of us in the world. Thank you. Thank you.
There we go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello, Eduardo. Hello, Lala. Well, I'm so glad to have the opportunity of interviewing you and help people to understand the wonderful things you're doing. Uh, you, you're, you're, what you're doing has an enormous symbolic value of the, uh, uh, for the world because their migration is one of the modern dramas. There are million people uh, who have had to leave their countries and just trying to survive in camps everywhere. And I remark the idea of just trying to survive because what's great from you is that you're giving them better ways to live and to, and to build a better life. So really this is the main impact of what you're doing, uh, help people who definitely need it. So my, my question, my first question is, do you have contact with international organizations that work with migrants? Uh, have they taken your experiences to, to improve what they're doing in the camps and the, in the borders. Thank you, Eduardo. It's a pleasure to meet you through this video. And first of all, I want to thank, of course, the Talbert Foundation Juris of the 2022 for this recognition. And also Alan Stonga and his team and the Starbucks Narcos Foundation, and of course, John um, Eliason. It's, 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 I'm, I'm humble, I'm humble with this recognition, which is not for Lala Loveda, it's for a team, family and friends that have been by my hand, uh, walking through this path. So in order to answer your question of the international cooperation or institutions around the world, of course, the Venezuelan migration in the region has been in the radar of the whole world. So we are the second migration or Venezuelans are the second migration in the world. There are almost 7 million people have fled the country for many, many reasons. And we let's not go there. So the most important thing is that the international organizations and the offices of the UN and ACNUR or the OEM are all of this um, um, uh, um, inst like cooperation, international cooperation, they are in Colombia or they are in the region trying to address um, the crisis. I don't like to talk about crisis because this is we are we're just we are just returning them the right to leave. No, that's that's an important thing to understand. So building trust was the first. Um, like challenge that we have so we can be recognized by these institutions and this uh, international or uh, offices as a trust partner to address all the issues and all, and all the and closing the gaps that we need with these people and migrants coming from Venezuela. So yes, we have contact with them. We are um, in conversations all the time. We are part of the tables and the round tables that they have um, um, in this, in, in, in the region, or for example, here in Colombia, in Cucuta, where I'm right now, um, we are part of this conversation. But it's, it's, it's a trust relation and you need to build trust. And you know, Eduardo, this is not something that you can build from one night to the day or from one day to another. So we have been working in trust and in actions, um, trust actions, since five years that we have been here in the territory. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Well, uh, there are many cases in the world in which the countries that receive migrants reject them, either for cultural or religious reasons, or because they feel that they're coming to take the jobs, the jobs of the local people. Uh, in your experience, is it possible to generate a positive relationship uh, of integration? And what does your social uh, technology contribute to, to it? How, how do you handle this problem of rejecting of fear between parts, both parts? Okay, the most important thing is that we need to be patient. We, we need to be patient and understand that the changes that the host community have 
um, in order to accept and to host and to receive new people. So we just had, or we are experiencing in right now the whole world watching the World Cup of Soccer, which every single country and every single team has a migrant in their team. We just we we just watching the the World Cup. I was I was uh, <clears throat> full of compassion watching the friends. Uh, team with all these migrants and also from Italy, from from Spain. So we need to understand that migration is part of this new era, and and but we need to be patient. So with our work here in Colombia, for more than I don't know, I've been living in Colombia for 15 years. So Colombia have been a host country for the last 20 years. So now we have been. We have been working in the change of narratives, okay, in order to pull down the fear of migration, the fear of the host community, which which is so important, and and trying to be um, a little bit uh, compassionate about the the Colombians receiving three million Venezuelans, like they are here. So when you change the narrative and you compare and you put them front side by side as human beings. And when do you understand that the solutions come from the communities and what, what do the host community and Colombians need to understand why Venezuelans are, are here and what are they bringing to the country? So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a work, it's a hard work, but it's a beautiful work, Eduardo, to work with this, put them together as, as equals, as when, when you work with two mothers and, and it doesn't matter where they are from or but they are there with the children fighting for their children's, uh, I don't know, um, access to education or access to, to some help. So it's, it's amazing when they find each other as the same human beings. So that's, that's the, narr the narrative that we are trying to address in our communities here at the border in from Colombia and Venezuela. And it's it's amazing the, the good things that we can achieve when when you start pulling down those barriers and when you start addressing the fear of the newcomers. But it's 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 a it's a process. It is. Are children important in this process? How do you handle that? Oh my God, Eduardo, I'm obsessed with children. I'm obsessed with children. Um, that's why I'm a teacher. So I understand that um, that's where the magic happens. When you are in schools, they don't see flags. In the schools that we are here in the border, they don't see flags, they see children. They see a boy or a girl, a friend or not a friend, but not because you're from another country. So. We try in our team to understand how we can be the students of those children. What are they are teaching us in this um, schools where they are all together, they are learning, they're learning to be citizens, they're learning to address all the, all the gaps that they are in their communities uh, and how they are part of the change. And we understand that when you address and when you work with the children, they are going to be the change factor of their family and of their community. When you work with them, they're going to be in their houses and in their families and in their communities, bringing all the information that we are working with them. So that's our secret weapon, let's say that. Our children are youngsters because sometimes on some programs, um, they're not addressed to the youngsters, to the teenagers, to the, so, so we started working with them. And you can imagine the girls, when you start working with them, um, I don't know, so uh, sexually um, uh, uh, classes that we're, good, we're giving them and the access and the right to, to understand their, their, their sexuality, they started bringing their friends from the community. Can I bring my cousin? Can I bring my my uncle, uh, can I bring my dad? So when we understand that, because we are there, and as I told you later, so the, 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 all the solutions comes from, from the community. So we understand 
hey, we're changing a whole community while you work with these children. So of course, and my obsession is the obsession of the team. So we are obsessed with the children. Our passion is to see how we can give them the tools so they will transform their school, their community, and their whole family, even a country, even a country. <laughs> uh, we, we have just one minute left. Thank you very much. It's very moving. and es muy emocionante what you have just said. <laughs> but uh, uh, what are your, in two minutes, your plans for the future? Well, my plans for the future is to never let the fear be bigger than my dreams. So I, 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 I embrace the fear to never stop learning from my communities and from the communities and to understand that we are only there to close some gaps, but we need to understand the, understand the communities and understand that this is a right. Migration is a right. And we need to have the actions in order to give the right and the duties to the people that um, have take the decision of leave their country and find their dreams in another place. So we are not the judges of these people. We have to be part of the inclusion of the people wherever, they, wherever we go. And we need to understand something. All of us are part of this, not because of Lala and Lala's team, because we have this NGO. You know, we, as you said, when we start this conversation, migration is the new era of this world. So everyone from, the, from our shoes, we need to be part of the inclusion. This is a right. And we have the right and we have the duty to make it happen. Thank you very much, Lala. I'm so well, glad that the chance to interview you and congratulations for the well deserve uh, award that you have just received. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. Hi, Ilya. Welcome. Hi, Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, India. And also, it's a great honor for the award, but also a great honor to meet uh, the inspiring uh, presentation of the previous uh, winners. So um, I'm really uh, so happy to be here. So, Ilya, I've really enjoyed getting to know you. And, um, you know, what I've, what I've been struck by is you are a storyteller. Uh, a world's teacher, a tech innovator and CEO, a chess player, and really somebody who's obsessed with truly leveling the playing field, if I may. And I really love how almost contradictory at times these roles are. Um, you know, one of the things that I think about a lot is how many technology CEOs really care about creating an inclusive community? Right, the world would be a very different place if if that happened more. Um, and one of the things that I love about innovators in general is that they see problems differently than others see problems, and that's also how they're able to solve those problems differently than others might solve problems. And often, what that means is that uh, solutions come from unlikely places. So Ilya, I'd love to start and have you tell us the story of actually how chess brought you to blind football. Oh, wow. So um, I used to be a chess player, so that means that uh, I'm always there to find solutions, <laughs> to find answers. And uh, back in my university years, uh, I was also a chess trainer. So it was a time that uh, School for Blind in my city, in Thessaloniki, in Greece, uh, they called me to... to to start as a coach uh, in the School for the Blind. And uh, we succeeded, we went also abroad and uh, with the champions of Greece at other time. And uh, two years after, uh, there was a global movement uh, to create uh, the football as an official sport. 
And uh, football is uh, for a blind, is an inclusive sport. So not only blind footballers score against uh, sided goalkeepers. So yes, I was a first volunteer uh, in this amazing sport. So um, turning my chess professional career as a coach, being a volunteer in this amazing sport was how it started to be always open-minded and truly between us, okay? Uh, I was not a very good goalkeeper. So when we lost, the other blind players tell me, Elias, we cannot change ourselves, but we can bring a better goalkeeper than you. Fair enough. So I was involved in blind football for different roles as a referee, coordinator, or as a chairperson nowadays. And uh, I'd love to actually hear the story you told me about when you were 12 years old and you were playing chess with somebody who actually couldn't see. Could you tell us yeah. that story? So one of the people that changed my life at that time was uh, Stratos. Uh, Stratos uh, was 19, I was 12 at that time, starting my you know, chess career. And we're playing in a, in a park outside. It was a raining season in June in Greece. And uh, it started raining. It was outdoor. And uh, everybody left. But Stratos couldn't see the others. So I asked him, do you want to keep playing or shall we stop? They were, okay, let's play under rain. So that's how I met Stratos. Then seven years after he was my pupil, and uh, he's like, uh, when we start playing football, uh, he's a legend. Also, the football stadium in Greece is uh, on his name. So I never, you know, imagined that uh, this will happen in my life, but uh, meeting, uh, meeting Stratos at that age will change also my life, and it really did. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you realized the need for a child's yeah. football? Um, and here, what I, I want to actually add is that the technology behind the blind football is really interesting. Um, and so, you know, we don't want to, of course, get too into the technical details that only you and I might really enjoy. <laughs> but can you tell us just a little bit about kind of what um, brought you to build a child's football and also a little bit about how it works? Okay, so um, the blind football, okay, now we're in Qatar, for example, we watch the games, uh, Messi and Bappe, they score a goal with uh, a ball that uh, the weight is about uh, 400 grams. Uh, but in order to start the blind football as the official sport, we put a mechanism inside to, to, uh, to listen to the ball when it uh, uh, moves, so that means it's more than half a kilo. It is so when we watch a video, when we watch a, a blind football, then uh, the ball is much heavier than the mainstream one. So this one challenge that uh, blind footballers uh, face. Uh, on the other hand, I always ask my professors, like an uh, adult educator, uh, especially for the youngsters. And I was always telling them, like, think out of the box, create your own ideas, imagine and uh, uh, rethink about the world. And it took me 20 years to realize the need to create uh, a mini blind football. A blind football that is uh, lighter, a blind football that is suitable for the children, it's safe. Uh, they can take them into the um, school bag. And uh, that's because of a second person that changed also my life and my perception is Leandros. Uh, Leandros, um, when I met him, he was three years old. Imagine that a three years old child can change your life. And um, he was born with sight in a sighted family. And uh, when he was one and a half, he lost completely his sight due to a health issue. And I met him like three years old in the school for a blind. It was his first approach. Where when I met him, you know, he's like a star. And uh, he was a volunteer in my, as you say, storyteller. I wrote a fairy tale about chess. And we're in the studio in the school for a blind. And yeah, he, he was uh, uh, telling uh, a small part of the um, fairy tale. And when I gave him the mainstream blind football, which was more than half a kilo, it was impossible to play in front of him. So it took me, as I said, 20 years to realize the real need to play children safe with this ball. So it's not about the technology, it is an innovation, it is about something new that comes to the world, but the most important thing and the magic behind it is it's not for sale, but it's only for donation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And tell me, why do you insist that the ball must be free? Okay, my role also in this uh, world is as a volunteer and also like, uh, so. I was never uh, there to have a profit. So I mean, when I had this idea, it was like for a beginning to, uh, you know, to make it uh, accessible to everyone. So this is one thing. But the other thing was like uh, the right to play and the right to quality education. 
as Mr. Eliasson said that before, it is okay, some things are general, but when you put into practice, when you see it in front of you, then come on, I mean, uh, you have to do something for that. And uh, uh, that's why, you know, from the beginning, uh, we said that we're going to do something new, we're going to change the world. Maybe we cannot change everything, but in our community, in our uh, things that we can uh, have an impact, then let's do it. And okay, it started five years ago, but uh, what we did uh, with, uh, as a team, as also Lara and, uh, said before, it's not about me, it's about the team behind. Uh, we really changed the rules in uh, 213 countries and territories so far. So it was a big change. Oh, yeah, one of the things I really enjoy about conversation with you is that you will drop these immense, massive uh, kind of change that you've been part of at the very end of a story where you focus really on, on talking about others. Um, but one of the things that I also appreciate about so many Talberg leaders, and I think you've all seen this um, from the other two leaders as well, Lala and Cheeto, is that there tends to be a, a start and a focus on the what we can call a local problem or the problem right in front of you. Um, and all of these leaders have taken that as a platform to really then bring about this global change. And that is what's unique. It is hard enough to think about and truly solve a problem right in front of you, but to then be able to pop up a level, to go from being on the stage to being in the audience and be able to look around and see, okay, this isn't enough. This is hard. It keeps me up nights, but it's not enough. We actually have to use this change to get to that global transformation. I've been really struck by that. Um, and so I do want you to spend a few minutes now and talk a little bit more about the different ways that um, that global transformation has come about. So you dropped at the very end of that last sentence, um, the availability of this um, you know, soccer ball, um, but also talk a little bit more about um, your role now mm -hmm. and what is this kind of global transformation that you are on a mission to bring about? Okay, we'll start with two words that I listened before from uh, Alan and Jan, it's about together and about hope. Okay, so for me, it's like a human saying, our local community is as strong as the weakest link. Okay, so uh, for example, blind pupils, we attend general schools where uh, are sighted and uh, visually impaired together. And okay, we have a right to education, but what about the, uh, to be together? So this is something that you can see also in your community, but then, you know, you can see all around the world is the same because we have an inclusive education uh, pillars in all over the world. So we start, you know, here in Greece, the Minister of Education approved this uh, uh, program, and then we can see, okay, so let's let's make it uh, global. So let's uh, uh, knock the doors around the world. So uh, and then comes the second word about hope, that uh, there is hope also in our uh, vision because now we're present in 213 countries and territories. But I can see but the sustainability because, okay, it's nice to have ideas, but what's going on in reality? Uh, Stavros Niarchos Foundation is also with us, Rosalind, that we're going to speak later on. She was a project, project officer from Stavros Niarchos Foundation when we knocked the door here in Greece. And we are very happy that we also approved from the almost the first year. So we saw the potential, the treaty of the blind, child, and football, because, you know, it's like uh, everybody loves football. I know you're based in, uh, uh, in Los Angeles and hopefully also um, in a month we're going to listen also to the good news because the other vision that I have is also like, it's not only about male, but also there is a global movement about female uh, uh, footballers also with visual impairment. So my bigger reason to make it more global is like not to leave uh, anybody outside. So uh, it will be the first time that they also applied in the Paralympic Committee to have also the female edition in Los Angeles 2028. And I'll give you just to finish like a, a short story like uh, what happened a month ago. Uh, we had Asia Oceania Championships in blind football. And in Iran uh, was with full men. Well, Australia came for the first time. And they, among the eight most competent blind footballers, there was one female. And imagine that in the draw, we play together Iran against Australia. Male against also male and female. There's also physical conduct, everybody. And there was no protest. We change the rules and we make it possible. Male and female coming also from countries that uh, have different uh, ideas about it. And 
it was amazing. So sometimes, you and know, Ilya, yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah. I, I'm actually going to to jump in, but I I love that story so much. I'm so glad that you uh, were able to bring that in. So you heard it here, everyone. Um, you know, the World Cup. We've had our first African team advance as far as it has, and thanks to Ilya, we will have women and men in blind football um, globally competing. So. Thank you so much. And you will now listen to an original composition written and performed by Nadia Washington. The piece is part of Talberg's Jazz for the Planet, a project encouraging leaders to act with the urgency and the focus that our global predicament demands. Thank you all. Let the words pull at you, the gravity of the moon. Thoughts trickle out the mouth, truth hits hard, a typhoon. Ancient technology holding memories with these shape shifting, prehistoric existence glistening, accepting everything as it should be. Her voice is like the sound of subtle chimes and whispers. The essence of all humanity, cyclical motion, depths of the ocean. A home of effervescent tranquility. What's really killing me is the blatant disrespect. Broken bottles, shipwreck, plastic wrapped around my neck. Seems to me we've forgotten all the life she keeps from conscious to unconscious. Yet we still treat her like a trash heap. The book says it won't be water for fire next time. Oh, makes us run from the sun, glacier past the shoreline. Yet we sit back, make a conscious choice, turn a blind eye. Insurrection, blaming selfish desires, fracking or spreading rumors like cigarette fire. Let's remember the substance that keeps us, cleans us, baptized by 70% completes us, giving life abundantly to every sister, brother. Stop for a moment in silence, appreciate her wonder. Those of you who have not seen that video before, that last image, the um, the diver is a past winner of the Telberg Eliasson, Telberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize, the great Sylvia Earle. I hope those conversations gave you a sense of why the jury selected those emerging leaders um, and why the Telberg Foundation has decided to invest more heavily in trying to identify emerging leaders, nurture emerging leaders, help them move even faster. Obviously, they're already moving incredibly fast. And we're going to launch a mentorship program with this cadre of, of leaders, which will be under the leadership of Mike Nekinchuk, uh, who is an applied neuroscience researcher and more important from my point of view, a, a director of the Telberg Foundation. Now I am delighted to welcome my friend Vishaka Desai, who has been central, which understates the case dramatically, in helping us build the leadership prizes over the last eight years. Vishaka is a senior advisor to the president of Columbia University and a senior research scholar at, at SIPA. She will interview, as you see on your screen, Pashtana Dirani, Kristen Nitsamira, and Selena DeSola, all of whom have been honored by the Telberg Foundation um, over the past years. Um, welcome, Vishaka. Welcome, Pashtana, Kristen, and Selena. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, and how wonderful it is to see Selena, Pastana, Christian, all of you together. Um, even though it's virtual, I'm delighted to actually have a chance to talk with you. Um, all of you who are on this particular program, listening to it, looking at it, you've heard amazing stories of these three winners of the Emerging Leadership Prize this year. I think what we're going to try to do now is to zoom out a little and to actually ask all of you who are, either you've been awarded as Emerging Leadership Prize, Selena, in your case, you were awarded the Leadership Prize, not necessarily as an emerging leader, because we didn't have that category then. But the reality is that all of you, from some of us of a certain age, would feel like you are at the beginning of your journey and where you are. But I know in the Talberg uh, leadership discussion, 
oftentimes we had this discussion about who is an emerging leader. Is it age? Is it experience? Is it the start of the journey or where they are? So I thought that we should really just begin with all of you who are very accomplished. You've done lots of things already in your youngish life. Um, as to how, from your perspective, when somebody tells you you're an emerging leader, A, how does it feel? B, how do you define that idea of an emerging leader? And let me just put the cards on the table. Why we want to do this from the perspective of the Talbot family is that we want to continue to refine this idea and then, then see where we can go with this. So all of you have to sing for your supper. And that means all of you in the audience as well, as to you can also help us shape it as we go forward. So the first question for all of you, and we'll start with you, Selena. Um, in a way, you've been doing this work longer than perhaps our other colleagues. But when you hear the word emerging global leader, so there is the notion of leadership, emerging leadership, and an emerging global leadership. How do you think about that word, those three words together? I, I think it's a really good question. And like you said, I think it's a conversation we've been having and it's kind of a, a live document, so to speak, the way we describe this. Um, I do think on the one hand, there's you're in a constant leadership journey. I'm sorry, in a constant emerging leadership journey when you're working in this space. I feel like it's... Um, there's always emergent information and learning that you have in any sort of journey in developing an, an initiative you learn from your peers, from the communities that we're working with. So there's always hopefully some sort of emergent learning um, forever in, in what we do. And um, I think that being said, like, like you said, less than age or the duration of a project or a venture or an initiative, it's almost like um, the emerging is more what stage it's at because you could, you could become an emerging leader at, you know, at a later later stage in your life because you're doing something that's new and different within your life. So um, I think, you know, those are the, some of the things that that I personally think about when I think about emerging leader. Although, you know, I'm 46 and I still feel like I'm emerging in a lot of ways in in learning, right? And and the thing about leadership is that there's so many people around the space. It's like you we're recognizing one person, but we understand that at the end of the day, they're huge teams that we're working with. So I think that's something I would say. And in terms of global, we're all so connected now that that I think that we just heard from all three um, leaders and, and everything they're doing is something that we can relate to at a global scale. So I think right. it's it's that simple, right? It's global because we could all think as I as they were speaking, I was like, wow, how could we do this in the, the areas of work? geographic areas of work where I am. So it's it's very exciting in that sense. I think that, that actually it gets to something, and Christian, I would love to follow that up with you in the sense that when we think about learning, even at my age, which is much later than where you all are, I continue to feel what I get excited about is that you can continue to learn. So there's something about continuous learning that's perhaps the quality of leadership that one can admire. And that is then somewhat different from emerging leader. So when, and it, it does strike me because both of you were the winners, Prashana, you and, and uh, Christian, is that that is something Nitya picked up on the emerging leaders this year. And that is all of you seem to be local and global at the same time, very early on you have that capacity that seems particularly different about the younger generation. The generation that I've actually called, you are all more global natives from earlier generation. So how do you think about that local global dimension? Because in your work, right from the beginning, you were there. How does that work? Can you mute yourself? Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, sorry, sorry. I was thought that uh, Pashtan will start first, but it's okay. So um, thank you, Vishka. So um, first I would like to congratulate uh, my, um, the new winners, our emerging leaders, uh, Shidola and Elias. 
I think as uh, Sela explained, it's a it's a it's a journey. Uh, it's a journey, and uh, leadership it's a, it's always a journey, and and we we'll learn from that. And uh, based from your question, uh, my simple definition is global is local as local is global. So depending which side of the world you are, uh, that it could be called local, it could be called lo local, uh, but the impact will be the same as you, if you are passionate, if you are uh, uh, sensitive to the environment. And I remember the last, um, uh, the last past years, the last decade, um, when people were mentioning about uh, leadership, uh, people were mentioning about first about the position. You need to be on the right position then it will impact, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, the environment and the society. Then, less, um, years later, I've learned that leadership is also about achievements. You know, it's good to be on the position. It's good to be on the right position, on the right place. But you need also to impact. There is some achievement. There is some record. There is some indicators or accomplishments. And it's just recently last year when I got um, uh, the Tolberg and discussing the Alan and other senior, then I learned also leadership is about character. You can achieve, you can be on the right position, but only character can impact other, other people. If you focus on humanity, then we need the balance between what impact you about your work, which is achievement, and what is the impact about people, which is the, your character. And, and the, the hardest journey for anyone from emerging to establish leaders is the journey to about the character, the transformation of your character to impact. And that will not stop, that will not end. Thank you. Uh, Pastana, speaking of journey, You've had quite a journey. Um, I remember when we actually gave you this award last year, uh, life was very different for you than where it is today. So when you think about the journey of an emerging leader, what are the ways that you think about leadership compared to when you were in Afghanistan and where you were and what you're doing now? Thank you so much for that question. Um, a person who has just a quarter old of a century this uh, last week, uh, it's very different for a person to be like, you know, seeing themselves as a leader. Like we like the responsibility. I never shy away from like saying, yeah, I like the responsibility and I own up to my responsibilities. I love organizing everything. But at the same time, um, it's very hard to, call yourself leader, especially when you're so young, you know, you are worried, are you taking someone else's space? Maybe they have done more work. Um, maybe their work is more impactful. Um, are you even worth it? And I remember when I got the Talbert Prize, I couldn't believe myself. Like when Alan called me and he was telling me, I was like, wait, what? Like he had to repeat himself and I couldn't believe it because it's like, oh, wow. So my work is actually worth something. My idea is actually worth something. And this journey was not easy. Uh, when I started, I was talking about corruption in my own government. So a lot of doors were actually closed on people like me. Uh, we were not welcomed because who would welcome a 19 year old girl in this elite educational space where all these big policy makers and stakeholders are talking and they couldn't find a solution in the past 20 years. And now you're coming here and telling us you have a better solution. Um, but at the same time, I think, um, since it's not just the fact that I am here on this panel and seeing this, I have said it again and again, that since winning that award, you know, we are welcomed in this leadership elite places, despite the age, despite that I am still very early on in my life. It's just been five years for me to work, you know, um, and uh, in, being included in these elite spaces where all these leaders have like 40 years of experience, 50 years of experience, and they're open to talk to you, share it with you and welcome your ideas. I think that has been the most fascinating for me. Um, life was hard back then. Uh, it still has its up and down. But um, back in the day when I won the Talbot Prize, I was just with one school. Today, we have four schools and we're opening the the one next week. So I think um, 
it takes time to nurture your leadership and it's a long journey, but it definitely gives you a lot of opportunities when you have access to a space like this and learn more and um, make the person that you want to be as a leader, you know, and claim it. So I think that one thing that you're pointing out, which is also something that often I've heard from younger leaders, is that when challenges occur, how to actually overcome those challenges is one of the places where they often feel they could actually use some other people with experience. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about this notion of experience and so-called wisdom that comes with experience. Uh, since there's been a lot of discussions about football and the World Cup, I was very struck when the US team lost one of the things that people kept talking about initially was, oh, they're young, they're energetic, they have lots to offer. When they lost, everybody said, ah, lack of experience, naivete, not quite seasoned enough to fight the team that they were actually working against. And I thought if they had won, what would we have said? Youth, energy, Life. So it's, there's something about this idea of initiative, commitment, passion that is very much associated with emerging leaders, as we have heard from all of you before, and even the winners today. Then there is this notion of experience and what that experience could give you. Going back to the football, people were saying, you know, it has to do with being able to foresee the challenges, to see what's around you and be prepared for that. Does that ring something true for you? Or what do we think about experience as an important ingredient to become an established leader? Or to put it another way, what would it take to be called an established leader versus an emerging leader. And let's take it with Christian, you, and then we'll go around. And each one of you can jump in. So just don't feel, and I'm gonna ask you to be a little brief so that we can get to a more conversation as well. So, oh, thank you, Shika. I think it's a, um, it's a great question. It's, um, uh, we all face challenges everywhere. We just have challenges from ourselves, from our society, from the environment, uh, for peers, and also for some of, uh, let's say, for realistic uh, part of uh, our life, you want. But my short, I think, experience is in leadership, we need, um, based on the conversation I heard um, uh, from uh, Alan, uh, which he says is a very pessimist, but I think he's more optimist. And uh, when you mention about hope, is we need to hope against hope. That's for me, it's the most really important. You know, you can hope when there is, when you have a backup, when there is something starting, when there is diplomacy, when there, you have funding, when you have access to A, B, C, D. Uh, uh, opportunities, but when there is no um, any kind of uh, means or resources, do you think hope as a place in that context? I say yes, because on 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 the on the sense on the sense of the challenges, my my perspective and my understanding is just as a, as a leader can be emerging or established is to hope against hope. And that's, for me, uh, it's the most important thing. And it seems to me that then the part of it is to keep the hope alive. As you become yeah, exactly. established, is to keep the hope alive, you know. Yes. Um, we have exactly two minutes left, I'm told. So what I'm going to ask you, um, and Selena, if you can just take that on, is that if you were asked five years ago, and say, you have a mentorship opportunity either to be a mentor to somebody or you yourself could have a mentor, any one of you, but let's start with you, Selena. What would you want from a mentor? What kind of things you think would be useful as a part of a mentorship program? I mean, lots of people use that word, but it's useful to think about, you know, it should be a mutually beneficial relationship but also yes. supportive one. 
And so what do you want from them? And what do you think you could give as a mentor to somebody else? You know, I think it kind of goes with the question that Christian was answering too. I think that the ideal is a pairing of, of that kind of energy of youth and, and, and the, what we consider wisdom, because I think there can be wisdom in both. Um, so I think when I think of a mentor really quickly, I think I'd like someone to help me think about the potential challenges based on a longer trajectory they may have had, um, but at the same time, also someone to think about the possibility. So I think there's, um, I like the idea of mentorships across kind of this spectrum of whatever is subjectively considered wisdom and experience, right? So I think that um, you need to sometimes have people shake you up a little. And in my case, being around so many young people is helpful in that sense as well. So I think the mentorship goes both ways. So both think ways, of yeah. the, the, the impossible is possible, right? Kind of this idea of like, let's do this and let's move in that sense of urgency. Sometimes we're too slow and young people have a much more present um, right. sense of urgency than we do. And passion. Yeah. Pashana? Um, I think uh, one thing we have to understand is young people have uh, energy and uh, to be that established leaders, you need to have some failures, you know, it's like you were talking about these uh, football, um, like the team, but the fact that we don't realize is that you cannot just have success all the way, you cannot be doing it all right, it's just impossible for you to be a leader, you need to lose some um, battles and excuse my battle jargon, <laughs> that's what comes from Afghanistan, but that's the reality. You just can't be an established led, a leader and you cannot get everything 100% right. And when it comes to mentorship, I think um, it goes both ways, as, as Selena said. But at the same time, as a mentee, I think you need to be able to offer something to your mentor. It could be um, giving them a, a, a sight in your own world. It could be maybe showing them how you work, you know, uh, or how you organize with your Gen Z experience, you know, post-1997. <laughs> so all of that, I think that's also something that um, a mentor would be interested to look in because the next 10 years, the world is going to change. It's going to be a different world. So maybe the mentor would want to fit in that world. And that's what a mentee could offer, especially when they're young. Yeah. Terrific. I think that in the short period that we've all had together, we have actually covered a lot of grounds, believe it or not. And I hope that it gives us as Talberg some new insight into what this program could mature into. It's an emerging program that needs to become an established program. So we're young too. So thank you so very much for joining us and congratulations again for this year's winners. And we look forward to more. Thanks again. Hi everyone, um, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, so I just wanna point out that um, we know we're running late, but hopefully we all feel that these issues are important enough for us all to hang in there a little bit longer. Um, so, so thank you everyone. Um, and I would also in turn like to welcome and congratulate this year's um, emerging leaders. So hi everyone and congratulations to Dola and Elias. Um, and thank you for um, creating this opportunity, essentially, to bring us all together from all over the world. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be here with you and to have the opportunity to hear directly from you um, about your experiences and acquire some insight as to what it means to be in your shoes and to be an emerging leader. So you know, reading through your numerous accomplishments and listening to you talk today, um, I think that there are a few things that sprung to mind. And I'd say the first is that um, all complex problems require simple solutions. But in your case, I'd say this is done with a twist. And when I say a twist, I mean with innovation in mind. So you all seem to have tackled important complex problems by applying simple, yet somehow sophisticated and innovative solutions. So you've adapted existing practice to tailor-made approaches, which actually help pre uh, meet previously unmet needs. So whether 
you know, I won't go through the list of accomplishments. I think we've all heard, we've all been inspired through everything that you shared with us today. Um, but one of the things that I feel that we haven't covered enough, and I'd like to cover through this session, um, is that you have a lot of similarities. You have a lot of things that make you unique, but one of the you know, co common threads that I've seen through the presentations and through getting to know you all is that you do all lead by example, but not for your communities. You lead by example within your communities. I think that's a very important distinction. And at least in my opinion, I'd say that's one of the things that um, makes you such successful leaders. So we'll go straight to the questions. Um, I think I'll skip, because we're very conscious of time, I think I'll skip the obvious question, um, which is what makes good leaders in your experience? I think that's gonna come out through a lot of the questions that we will cover. So I'll start off by addressing my first question to Lala. Um, Lala, I think, you know, I wanted to ask you, and I, I'd like to know more about what in your journey was what you considered to be the most defining moment, something that shaped the way you are, shaped the way you work, shaped the way you lead, and what inspired you to go on this journey? Hi, Rosalind. Well, I think I have been answered, I have been having these questions, um, like from one of my team on Monday that we were having like the end of session, uh, end of the year with, with the whole team. And she asked me, she came to me and she asked me, where do you imagine that you are going to be in this place? At what age do you imagine that you're going to be in this, in this time of your life? And I didn't have an answer. I didn't imagine it. I didn't, I didn't. I, I, I knew that maybe I was on the path when my migration um, to Colombia has, when I was here and a few years ago, I understand why, the why I was here in Colombia. Because I thought that I was here because it was my family was moving here, my husband's work or something like that. But finally I realized right now that that wasn't the main reason that I arrived to Colombia 15 years ago. So the reason was here to understand Colombia through their communities. So as I told you, I'm a teacher. So and a special teacher, a special needs teacher. And I think that when you, when you understand that you are a teacher and you have this passion for children, so maybe you see yourself as a leader because of the teacher, structure that you have but when you are a teacher you understand that you are the student not the teacher so um i imagine i didn't i didn't realize that i was leading or that i was a leader just when all this four years ago when we started with uh, my my friend side by side comparte por una vida with the deep silva we understand that we were leading a, a bunch of people that wanted to be part of this dream. They were dreaming the same. So we started working and, and understanding that everyone is a leader and that we were the only leaders of our lives first. So the example is so important, but also that we need to lead with, um, I don't know, with uh, like parent and being, um, I don't know, some, some, like we were leading to transform. So we needed to understand what's what's leading. So I think it's a new it's a new it's a new thing in my life, like understanding my life as a leader and trying to get all the things that that we that has come to us. So I think it's a it's a it's a really brief time <laughs> that I understand that everyone is a leader, and now we're telling that to our to our children, we're telling that to our families that you are you, you need to start be the leader of your life first and you don't need to have like a position in a company or like this huge achievement or a qualification or a qualification. Of course, you need to be prepared, uh, but you everyone is a leader and we need to lead with um, in a current way, in a compassionate way and with excellence. 
of your life first. So I think I'm 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 a bit new, quite new in this little thing. Thanks to Talberg, now I have a big, big, big uh, responsibility of being um, to address my 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 new role as a leader. So um, hopefully, I will answer more technical next year <laughs> this question. <laughs> I'm I, learning I think from the way from the way you describe it. I don't know if it is such a new role. I, th I think we said that you didn't realize you were a leader. It's such an important attribute to a successful leader. That if you're, you know, I guess to a certain point, if you do understand that you're doing it, if you're doing it consciously, you're probably doing it for the wrong reasons. So, so mm -hmm. I think that's a very important attribute. Thank you. Um, Chido, um, I was hoping if, you know, you could share some insight. So, you know, again, one of the, the important things that, you know, I was thinking of reading through all of your, of everyone's accomplishments and, and hearing everyone speak, Successful leadership doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, and in order to have the desired impact, giving needs to go both ways. So, you know, it's not just about what you can give to, for lack of a better word, beneficiaries of the most vulnerable people in, um, in many instances, but how, do, how does this get reciprocated? So could you share a little bit about your experience working with the broader community and how that dynamic works? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think um, my journey has been a lot about uh, building a platform for collaboration. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think what's very important, which I had to learn very early on, is that creating this platform for collaboration activates ownership in the communities. Because the kind of problems that we are addressing do require that you give people the belief, the self-belief that uh, this is our responsibility, we can do this, we can do something. And uh, when you look at uh, where our world today is, activating the sense of collaboration, partnership, if you look at it in terms of SDGs, you see more and more that the broader world is trying, working to figure out collaboration. However, the people that we work with are the people who are always left behind. And so I think the, the journey has been a lot about how do you start modeling, modeling collaboration in these kind of circumstances so that while you're addressing these needs, you are appealing to a big problem on the global uh, uh, scene, which is partnerships. How do you help people where they are now so that they can actually do more than just put food on the plate? So it's been a, a lot of learning about how collaboration works in difficult circumstances and um, uh, how to make the different worlds communicate. Uh, the village to communicate to the global world and to, I mean, if you think about issues of uh, uh, climate change, we are working with people who are not able to put food on the table. You cannot just go with a raw message on climate change. You have to interpret the full message of climate change into actionable points where you can have an entry point in any different community. That's so important. Thank you. And one of the things I noted reading through all the incredible work that, that you've accomplished, um, one of the things I've got here in my notes is um, give a person a mushroom and you feed them for a day, teach a person to cultivate mushrooms in an innovative, economically sustainable and adaptive way, and you can feed them for a lifetime. So, so I really see that coming across through the discussions we've been having today. Yeah, um, it's... It's a lot about activating people to understand their ecosystem and to find their place in it and, and, and that their in influence on their surrounding ecosystem feeds back to them and, and, and that it's a cycle and they need to be a part of that cycle in a responsible way. Exactly. Um, Ilya, it's very nice to see you again. Um, it, it's been a few years um, since I first got to know uh, all the incredible work you're doing with social inclusion and sports um, for children with 
um, visual impairments. And I think one of the things that I definitely knew about you, but I'm also seeing with everyone else here, um, is that none of you are complacent. So none of you ever sit still. Nothing's ever enough in a good way. Um, and it feels as if you're constantly uh, trying to take something that already works well to the next level and trying to make it work even better. Um, so, you know, I, I was wondering, where do you see this journey taking you in the next five or, or 10 years? What do you see as the next step in your project and this leadership journey? Thank you, Rosalind, for very nice words. Uh, it was so great that uh, it's a marvelous journey and I'm so happy that you're also part of this from the beginning. Um, working with children also through the campaign is something that uh, you, know, you have to be open-minded because now Leandros, who is also like uh, the ambassador because he was my inspiration, he's now 10 years old. And he's also a symbol in Greece because he started raising his voice about accessibility, about the human rights. And uh, also there are many children around the world, female and men, and we're going to see also in the Paralympic Games, the access to sport. So it's something that is very dynamic. It's something that we are, it's not like just the idea. It's something that we're going to grow all together. So, you know, thinking about my life five years ago, but I have never thought about this. And I'm saying now that it took me 20 years to realize a need. What did I do? the last 20 years. So that's what happens also in the next five or 10 years. I hope that uh, in 2028, I will be with Nithia in uh, Los Angeles Paralympic Games with female also footballers so with visual impairment, but something that's also in my heart, the um, you know, accessibility for sports for female, male equally, and uh, to have also equity. And uh, also like I'm missing still uh, seven UN countries, so maybe you can also help me if uh, you're here from Timor or from other, some islands in uh, Oceania. I tried to ice in North Korea, but it was not possible yet, but I still have some goals to, to reach there. And um, it's something that, you know, as you, as you mentioned, uh, it's something like really alive. So let's see. We'll be here to, to support those goals. <laughs> And hopefully also Mr. Leerson will be also the ambassador, Alan from USA, he will be ambassador with the balls. And uh, if we all jingle the ball, that means that also we'll pass a message for the, uh, all children to have also the right. And it's also, as we also discussed with the Stavros Norks Foundation, it's not only the intervention that we make once for the ball, but the sustainability. The things that we do, they interfere. We go to the schools, general schools, where pupils with visual impairment are together with general ones to make an impact, to have a network of all these schools, but will also uh, help us for the sustainability of this campaign, hopefully for many years. Thank you so much. And thank you, Rosalind, for um, both what you've done in terms of your work in SNF and what you've done today. Um, and that, in fact, gives me an opportunity to, which I it was intending to do, to thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. This program does not exist without SNF's support. Um, and, and as I said Tuesday in our last conversation, the support comes in two forms. One, there's financial support, which in this world you need financial support. Far more importantly, not just Andreas Trakopoulos, but all of the people I've worked with at SNF over the years, very much get what we're trying to do. Uh, the support we receive uh, from you, Rosalind, from your colleagues is incredibly important for us to try to continue doing uh, what we're doing. So thank you very much for that. And I want to end the program by congratulating uh, Cheeto, Lala, and Elias uh, for the award, but far more importantly for what you're gonna do next. Because um, this is, as you just said, Elias, and as you asked, Rosalind, this isn't about the past. Uh, this is about the future. Um, you're going to change and affect and impact many lives, and hopefully we can help you do that. So congratulations for all of that. That's what you have to do when you do this thing virtually. It, it, it's one of the many downsides of virtual. But finally, I want to thank all of the people uh, who make this happen. Um, I mentioned at the start that there were 2,400 nominations. That means 2,400 nominators. Many, many more thought about it and didn't actually nominate all of the nominees that worked with us in the process. Uh, the pre-jurors, the jurors, uh, Martin Coates and his video team, um, SNF's team, 
And the two people without whom none of this happens, um, and you've all met them, Sarah Arison and Cecilia Nordstrom. So again, thank all of you for that. Um, and, and you keep up the good work. There we go. So last thoughts, um, it's the holiday season. I wish everyone happy holidays, Merry Christmas, uh, a happy new year, but far more importantly, a productive new year. Uh, and most importantly, you have to promise, to, you all have to promise to nominate great leaders uh, in 2023. Thank you and see you next year. Bye-bye.